Is Brady Cook the leader to be Missouri's starting quarterback this fall? Well, let's talk about Eli Drinkwitz's comments that has Mizzou Nation a buzz right now on Locked On Mizzou. You are Locked On Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and the central scrutinizer of Missouri Tigers football and basketball. Thanks for making Locked on Mizzou your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And Ben Fredrickson at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, well, he got... A lot of Tiger fans talking last night. Quote, this is from his Twitter page, a little update on the Mizzou quarterback competition. Eli Drinkwitz categorizes it as Brady Cook and challengers more than a wide open competition. Could change, of course. Cook is full go after shoulder surgery. Now, really, the biggest piece of news there to me is that Brady Cook is already a full go in his recovery from shoulder surgery. Obviously, not nearly as severe of a labrum injury as as could be, as we've seen with Andrew Luck, for instance, the type of injury that ultimately had him surprisingly retire a few years ago. Obviously, Cook's not that severe. He played through it all of last season, but hey, you like to see, you never know, when you start cutting into your body, you never know how things are going to progress. Well, so far, at least, it sounds like Brady Cook is progressing nicely. So just for the young man, I'm very happy to hear that. And obviously, as a Missouri fan, well, we should be happy for that as well because absolutely nothing is settled here at quarterback. And I think that's maybe the biggest take here is I think Missouri fans are right now, at least a, a a lot of Missouri fans are just assuming too much right now. Number one, I think assuming that Brady Cook is not a part of this competition, well, that was foolish. Number one, why wouldn't he be a part of this competition? He took the ball every time he was available and healthy last season. But I think also people are assuming a little bit too much on the other side here, just taking Eli Drinkwitz quite literally in this statement. To me, this could easily just be coach speak. Because quite honestly, one thing we know about Eli Drinkwitz, he doesn't really love to share a lot of information with the fans and especially the local media especially this time of year, right? He likes to rile people up occasionally at SEC media days. Maybe he'll give a little bit of insight to a national writer on occasion. When it comes to the locals, he's not giving us a whole lot. So the idea that he's just giving this to Ben Fred here, hey, here's your exclusive, Brady Cook's going to be the starter. That's how a lot of people seem to have interpreted this information. That's just not how I interpreted it at all. I think it's much more of a coach speak thing that, hey, guess what? On this squad, you don't lose your spot because of injury. So somebody's going to have to take the job from Brady Cook. That's what it sounds like to me. Again, let's not overreact to this statement. It's the spring. This is this is what's happening today. Even if Eli Drinkwitz, even if we should take him at 100% face value here, Well, that doesn't mean things can't change between now and September. Yes, Brady Cook could lose this job. No question about it. Jake Garcia came here to compete. All right? The the University of Miami kid, former five-star guy, he absolutely came here thinking he's got a chance to start. Same thing with Sam Horn, by the way. So, really, this should be a really full-throated, at least three-way competition for sure. Who knows what Jabari Johnson is going to look like when he gets onto campus. And by the way, some of the buzz coming from people who actually saw that indoor Mizzou spring game is that junior college walk-on Dylan Leibel, I believe that's how you pronounce his last name, L-A-I-B-L-E. Well, apparently he was maybe the most impressive guy, at least in that short period of time. So 
it, perhaps an interesting name to add to the fold there, received offers from Eastern Michigan and North Texas out of high school. So a guy who did have some lower Division One offers, but I don't know, apparently didn't qualify or who the heck knows. The co- obviously, he's about a COVID you know, scenario there in terms of holding him back his academics or development. I, you know, there's a lot of different cases there. But regardless, I think it's going to be a three-way competition, folks. I just thought I'd throw that name out there because some Missouri fans have been mentioning that young man's name. But I'd say the odds of him starting in September are probably about as good as Tommy Locke's as well. <laughs> Bottom line is, if you're a Missouri fan, don't dismiss Brady Cook whatsoever in terms of his his position in this competition. He's very much going to be a part of this quarterback competition. I see it as a three-man race at this point for sure. But at the same time, if you're just assuming based on what Eli Drinkwitz said to Ben Fredrickson yesterday that, that Cook is by far and away the leader in the clubhouse, I just don't think there's a lot of evidence for that either. So... Let's maybe take what Eli said yesterday with a bit of a grain of salt. And you know what? Let's talk a little bit more football. An interesting bit of news dropped just before I started recording here. Emmanuel Pregnon, an offensive guard, has committed to Southern Cal. And, well, what does that have to do with Missouri, you might be asking yourself? Well, because Cameron Johnson, the former Houston player who entered the transfer portal, well, he might be affected by that. He basically has told us he's down to USC and Missouri. The Trojans were recruiting him to play left guard, whereas Missouri wanted him to play center or at least or at least give center a shot, which Johnson, by the way, sounds very much open to. And, of course, his former offensive line coach, Brandon Jones, is now the offensive line coach at Missouri. So, obviously, Jones and Johnson very familiar with each other. Again, I, I just think – Pregnon here, a big time, one of the biggest, literally and figuratively, one of the biggest players in the transfer portal, a guard there playing Johnson's maybe preferred position. That seems to give Missouri a better chance, in my opinion. At least it sure would seem to on paper. And coming up, a major rule change is coming to college football this coming season, somewhat akin to Major League Baseball's pitch clock, although I have to say, I'm in love with Major League Baseball's pitch clock. This new change to college football, I'm a little bit less sure about, I have to say. So I want to talk about that. But first, if you're looking for a delicious snack, but you don't want all the sugar and calories, well, you got to try the best tasting protein bar of all time. It's built. You got to try this. It's built bar, folks. They're healthy and taste amazing. Seriously, they taste so amazing, you won't think that they're relatively good for you, again, you got to try it to know for yourself. These bars are covered in 100% real dark chocolate. That's right, real chocolate, 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, a whopping 14 grams of protein. I'm not really sure how Built does it, but I do know that you can find their bars at Walmart, at Sam's Club, and of course, Built.com for all the flavors you can possibly handle. So, again, go to Built.com, Sam's Club, or Walmart for your Built Bars. Locked On's NFL Mock Draft Special is here, and it's bigger than ever. Follow along all 32 teams' first pick in a six-episode Ultimate Mock Draft experience. Only Locked On can deliver. All episodes are available now on Locked On NFL Draft on YouTube, and of course, wherever you get audio podcasts as well. So it turns out this coming season, no more stopping clock after first downs until the final two minutes of each half in college football. Now, obviously, this is in an effort to shorten the games, quite simply. I think a lot of this has to do with, well, just the broadcast windows. I think maybe the TV partners are probably going, hey, You guys are kind of messing up our broadcast windows here. We like our our primetime games to actually start on time on the network they're supposed to be on as opposed to, hey, switch over to ESPN News or something like that to watch the first quarter of this game. I think that's as much of the motivation here as anything. But 
Certainly the game's going to be shorter, but unlike Major League Baseball, I'm just not sure that that needs to be that big of a priority for college football because to me, college football is, there's obviously so little of it. There's 12 games a year. There's maybe six or seven games at home if you're lucky, if you don't have any neutral site type games. So to me, I'm just, as a college football fan, as a season ticket holder, as a, as a tailgater, I'm just not really that concerned about getting out of the stadium an extra half hour early. Again, 162 baseball games, well, I sort of get it. And also, what Major League Baseball has done is they've actually, what they've gotten rid of is the, is the messing around time, the dead time. Because we haven't gotten rid of any outs or innings or we haven't shortened the count. The game remains the same. The amount of baseball that you're actually getting is the same. To me, if you want to make the game shorter, I don't know that I want to see fewer snaps because now I'm actually seeing less football. See, again, the pitch clock in baseball, you're still seeing the same amount of baseball. It's just condensed into a two and a half or three hour package instead of three and a half or four hours often during the regular season. And by the way, again, over 162 games, if you happen to be somebody who watches the lion's share of those, attends a ton of them, yeah, that really adds up. But again, on a Saturday for college football, just not that something I'm worried about. I've also seen people say, hey, maybe the halftime could be a little shorter, 20 minutes in college football versus I believe just 12 minutes in the NFL. Again, as somebody who attends these games, I'm not mad at all about that length of time for halftime. I think 12 minutes would actually be too short. You wouldn't have time to to get through the bathroom line. A lot of people wouldn't, quite honestly. I mean, that's just the nature of halftime is, hey, everybody's leaving their seats for often the first time to get to get popcorn, to go use the facilities, whatever it might be. I'm just telling you, if you're at the game, 20 minutes is absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. If anything, if you want to actually get rid of the dead time between plays, all of the nothingness that is happening at times during college football, well, then get rid of instant replay. Or at the very least, if you don't want to get that radical, at the very least, expedite the process. Because if you're a St. Louis Battlehawks fan, for instance, if you've watched the XFL at all this season for even 10 minutes, you've probably realized, oh, they actually have a smarter instant replay system than any other football league out there. They have dedicated people basically sitting in a, in a production truck somewhere or maybe a studio somewhere. I have no idea where these people are, but the point is they're immediately on it. They're, they're watching every single play on a replay immediately. There's no challenge system that needs to be triggered or anything like that. No, they're on it immediately. They expedite these replays so much better to the point where I'm going, okay, I'm kind of a get rid of replay guy, definitely in basketball. In football, I'm a little mixed. I think it can work in football if you do it quickly and efficiently. And I think, again, the XFL has shown that you can do that. Why can't college football? The amount of money that's being thrown around in that league, that sport, is exponentially more than the XFL. So you know what, cheapskates? Invest in something that'll actually make the fans' experience better for a change. Well, folks, you might have noticed, all you everydayers out there, I'm not exactly getting out everyday content right now. I am fully in off-season mode, I have to admit. But during the season, I truly do try to live up to that your team everyday moniker, but I have to say I, I didn't always accomplish that this past winter during Mizzou basketball. Large part of that because, well, quite honestly, I was dealing with my uncle's declining health and ultimately his death this past January. So obviously that's been a real tough time for my family and myself and, and everything that went along with that. But you know what, this past weekend we had a celebration of life for my uncle and, well, I had some pre-recorded comments that I thought I'd share with you here on the podcast. So nothing more about Missouri basketball and football here today. So if you'll just indulge me, just wanted to share this with all of you. This was, again, my uncle John Hall, a true son, former marching Mizzou guy 
for an ever brief period of time. But you know what? Enough, enough explanation. I'm just going to play my comments from this past weekend with you right now. Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming today. My name is John Miller, and John Hall was my uncle for the past 40 years. And I'll be honest with you, I was originally supposed to read this live, but in the spirit of Uncle John's extreme attention to detail, I wanted to get this as close to perfection as possible. As all of you are aware, John was a highly intelligent man, so it really meant the world to me that we formed a collaborative, creative relationship in my 20s. John would often send me his political opinion pieces before publication or after the occasional rejection and ask for my thoughts. And while John and I agreed on a lot, we mostly debated our disagreements passionately via email, but it was never contentious. Quite the opposite, in fact. I was truly flattered that my uncle even cared one iota what his 20-something nephew thought one way or the other. And in the early years of our collaboration, I, I think it's fair to say that neither one of us really knew what we were doing. Occasionally, I would publish John's work at my now defunct website called dissectingpopculture.com. Well, these days I host a relatively successful sports podcast called Locked on Mizzou, but John's creative career took off probably a decade before mine did with his work being published at highly trafficked websites like lourockwell.com and most frequently of all at the American Thinker. And one of John's editors at the American Thinker, J.R. Dunn, published A Farewell to John N. Hall last February, and I will share that with you now. Time has claimed yet another American Thinker contributor. John Nelson Hall died this past January 17th at the age of 76. John was born on August 7th, 1946 in Kirksville, Missouri, to Glenn Franklin Hall and Carolyn Joanne Nelson Hall. He spent most of his life in the Kansas City area, graduating from Park Hill High School in 1964 and the University of Missouri-Columbia four years later. Writing for AT, John contributed an impressive 418 pieces, which puts him firmly in the upper bracket of AT writers. Rarely did a month go by without a new contribution, and usually more than one. His first piece appeared in January 2009. His final one, Citizenship and Intervening in Elections, on October 30th of last year. His essays were marked by close argument, solid research, and attention to detail, unsurprising coming from a professional computer programmer. He ranged across the entire gamut of political, social, and even artistic topics, including constitutional law, reindustrialization, Bobby Fischer, election law, the films of Ridley Scott and Lars von Trier, the Tea Party, and Obamacare. Two topics that particularly drew his interest were election law and economics, notably inflation. My first exchange with John, with whom I worked for many years, involved this very topic. John was ahead of his time here, clearly foreseeing our current inflationary predicament as early as the mid-teens. His work on electoral law, particularly as regards to election fraud was also prescient as well as being far more realist, though never cynical, than most concerning our battered and debased electoral system. John was also a gifted musician, playing the trumpet, which gained him a full music scholarship from Mizzou. He gave up the trumpet in favor of opera singing in later years, possessing what is described as an amazing basso profundo, that graced performances with the lyric opera of Kansas City. He had the gift of perfect pitch and could cite read to order. John also expressed his love of opera for the American thinker in an essay entitled A Most Singular Woman. He also was something of an artist specializing in pencil portraits 
of beloved composers such as Wagner, probably his favorite composer, and Arturo Toscanini. What is most impressive about all these achievements is that they were gained while John was suffering from severe obsessive-compulsive disorder. John's case was serious enough to curtail such things as travel and total freedom in social life. Those who suffer from this affliction, too often dismissed as trivial, will know how debilitating it can be. John never called attention to it. I personally worked with him for many years and had no idea until I was informed by his sister Patricia after his death. John leaves behind two sisters, Janet Hall Barnhart and Patricia Hall Miller, nephews Clint Barnhart and John Glenn Miller, and a niece, Jennifer Barnhart Parrish. John's contribution to the American thinker was enormous, and he can never be replaced in any meaningful sense. The work remains the legacy of a man of great courage, insight, and passionate intensity. All right, thanks so much for listening to that. Ironically, my uncle was not a fan of team sports whatsoever. In fact, found them quite silly. So, But at the same time, a big-time Mizzou guy, loved Mizzou, loved his time at the university and in Columbia. So just thought this was an appropriate end to the podcast today. So thanks for indulging that. Thanks for telling a friend to go to LockedOnMizzou.com for all your links to YouTube, Apple, Spotify, the whole deal. So until next time, hopefully some big-time news, some big-time Missouri recruits are coming our way pretty soon. And if they do, I'll be here to talk about it as soon as I can, right here on Locked on Mizzou.